Okay, so um, my name is Scott Golightly. I'm a regional director. I had a bunch of demos. I'm going to show you some different things. Um, and I've got way more than I can cover in the time that we have. So uh, don't feel bad about stopping me because I'm not going to finish anyway. All right? Unless you guys listen really fast. If you listen fast, we might finish. All right, so uh, Visual Studio 2017 came out. Um, I'm trying to remember the date on it. It was sometime like March 7th or something like that uh, that it was released. Um, much fanfare, you know, live streaming. You can go back and hit Channel 9 and see all the information there. So uh, I'm just going to try and give you an overview of some of the things that uh, I think is going to help your productivity and help you. And then I will try to stop long enough to answer some questions about upgrading because uh, I think that's a very important thing. So. One of the things that comes with Visual Studio is C Sharp 7.0. Well, it comes with the, the uh, uh, .NET framework that you install. Oh, by the way, April 11th, the Creators Edition ship with .NET Framework 4.7. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I haven't spent enough time with it to be able to do a whole presentation on what's new and latest and greatest in .NET 7, but I imagine some of this stuff here with C Sharp 7 is going to be there as well. But We'll talk about some of the features there, unless you guys have already done a C-sharp 7. I guess that's the first question to ask. No, not seeing. I'm seeing blanks there, so we'll hit that. That's next month. Oh, that's next <laughs> month? All right. Uh, if, if it is next month, I'll skip that and, and go on. Don't skip it. Okay. All right. I don't want to steal somebody's thunder and you know, make it really hard for them. All right. Um, so this kind of highlights. Um, we have out variable support, pattern matching, tuples, deconstructors, local functions, a digit separator, and uh, re uh, ref returns and local samples. So I'm just going to hit debug, because that's the way you start every presentation, is you start debugging and hope that people follow along. Um, but no, actually it's probably better to do it this way. Um, and if I remember my keys, shift alt enter, I believe, yes, brings me to full screen. So that gets me, so you can hopefully see the code there in the back. Um, if not, there's uh, you know, a couple of seats in the front or just squint. Um, okay, so first thing we're going to look at is uh, out variables. So uh, this line where the, the breakpoint is, before C Sharp 7, if you were going to do any kind of out variable, I'd have to declare my i, I'd have to declare my j, I'd have to assign them a value. Um, the thing is that in probably 99% of the time, you don't care what that value is when you put it in, you just need to have it have a value so that you can get something out. Okay, so with C Sharp 7, they've fixed that. You can just declare out int i, out int j. Ints are kind of funny that way. Their value types are going to be zero because that's what they are. But if these were objects, it would still be okay being null and being set within the, the method. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you can feel free to clap. Anyway, um, this will only set the scope, though, inside this if statement. So outside of the if statement, i and j are back to undefined. So um, if you need them to be persistent across your method or something, either you need to store them somewhere else or uh, you, know, you need to go back to the old style where you declare them and then pass them in with an out. So either way works. Let's go on to the next one, which is pattern matching. I first heard pattern matching and I'm like, what are they talking about? Well, um, a lot of times we have a whole bunch of ifs uh, you know, for those few people who actually know someone who programs in VB.net, um, that's one of the things that they would hold over the C-sharp program. It's like, oh, you guys, your ifs and your case statements, so archaic. You're checking this and this and this and this. We can put a when statement in there so we can say, if it's this, when, that, and we can simplify things. Well, now C-sharp people can do that too. Okay, so here we've got... Uh, we're checking an expression and a switch statement. It's basically the same code. So I'm just going to kind of go through the uh, expressions and um, I'll leave you to kind of glance at the switch statement. But um, the first thing we're checking to see if a type. So if content is a string, um, and, and that's all we care about is, is it a string? If I pass in an int, if I pass in something else, it will not go through this if statement. The other thing I'm doing there is I'm assigning then, if content is a string, I'm assigning it to a variable called stir. Uh, and then that way I can manipulate it, work on it, knowing that it's a string. The compiler will see it as strongly typed string, not as uh, you know object or whatever else. 
um, your your content may have been. Um, if content is hello pattern, so I'm in this case I'm just doing a compare. So it's basically the same thing as saying content equals equals hello pattern, but um, I can also then you know kind of chain these together if I want to. And the last one is the var pattern where I say content is var j, which basically says if content doesn't throw an exception when I try to read from it, which I've yet to see that in however many 15 years of programming with the .NET framework, um, assign it to j, to the variable j. Now, a lot of I saw this and I was just like, this is the dumbest thing ever. All you're doing is assigning content to j. But the thing is that um, there was a very good article I read that talked about how this will also do your type uh, coercion. So if you're trying to convert it to a particular type, um, a lot of times just comparing it to something, and especially if somewhere else in the code J is used as, uh, I don't know, a double or something like that, um, a lot of times the compiler will cast it right now, you know, because it knows it needs to be a double later on, and it says, oh, I can do it right now, rather than somewhere, you know. So anyway, um, there's that. Uh, the other thing is that you can also do a win after this, so content is var j when uh, j is type of something or other. Or, yeah. I guess you wouldn't want to say type of, but when j implements or, or something like that. So you, could, you can further constrain it, have multiple checks, and just assign it to whatever variable you're going to put it into. All right. Case does exactly the same thing. If I scroll up, and you can see that. Um, in my switch statement, I've got strings. I've got hello pattern. I've got um, uh, then also the, the var j. So in this case, the last switch content, case var j, is basically a case default. Okay? Uh, but now instead of saying default and looking at content, you're assigning it to j, which then you can, you know, I, I don't know, maybe use shorter variables. I, this, in this case, this is one of those, yeah, if, if you're just using it as a default in a switch statement, uh, maybe people program different than me. I would look at it and go, yeah, there's no sense in having that. But, all right, let's go on and look at. Hey, Scott, yeah. Did you not do all those switch statements or all those case statements in one switch? Or you, not break them? Um, you could do them in one switch. They were breaking them up just to kind of keep it the same as the if. Gotcha. Up there. Um, so here we've got uh, um, tuples or tuples, you know, one of those words that nobody knows how to pronounce, but everyone's got a very strong opinion on their correct way to do it. Um, so tuples are one of those things that have been around since I think uh, .NET Framework 3, maybe 3.5, I don't remember. But the problem that with tuples, the, the place that you'd use them generally is if you wanted to return something from a method. You wanted to return a status code and some value. And so you could create a, a class, you could create an anonymous class, or you could just use a, a, a tuple. Um, the thing with tuples is that they were, uh, the different elements were identified as item one and item two. So you'd say variable name dot item one, variable name dot item two, and inevitably somewhere down the road somebody would come along and would say, oh, I need a third one, but it makes more sense to put it in the middle instead of at the end. Now all of a sudden, you know, existing code that was looking at item two is looking at something totally different than they were, Ugh, it's dead, all right? And, you know, if you're lucky, your unit tests catch it, um, if you're not lucky, then uh, your users catch it. So, <laughs> so we don't want users catching things like this. So what we're going to do is go and look. Here we have, um, in my method that I'm calling, I use parentheses. Where did my mouse go? There we are. So this here defines a tuple. Okay. Um, two things before I get into that. One, this is different than the system.tuple is system.value tuple, which you have to pull down from NuGet. So um, you, you have to be aware of that and actually go out and get it. Otherwise, you go to do this and it doesn't compile and you're sitting there scratching your head like I was going, gosh, it's right there in the code. What's going on? Um, yeah, you get restore as your friend there. Um, and the other thing is, is that even though here I'm defining the tuple and I'm giving it variable names or names for the position, first name, middle name, last name, item one, item two, item three still work. Okay. But they, and they still work as before, so that, that is position dependent. So you still have to kind of scrub your code. So if you're using item one, item two, item three, up to item nine, because you can have up to nine things in a tuple, um, you, you have to either change everything over to use the variable names, 
or write yourself comments and hope that somebody reads the comments and believes them about whatever you do, don't reorder things. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's something to be aware of. But here I've got first name, middle name, last name that I'm declaring as variables. And then up here where I use it, um, I call split on full name, or split full name, and I get back a tuple, and then I can use dot first name, dot middle name, and dot last name notation on that. So. Can you just clear it as a var rather than the true type? Um, no. For um, the, the, the tuple has to know, because it's object, I guess you could declare it as object. I, actually, let me, well, I'm in the middle of debug. If I change it to var now, it'll just blow up on me. I, I, I said no too quick. The more I thought about it, the more I thought the compiler will figure out what you're doing. It, it probably will cast it correctly, and if it doesn't, even if it casts it to object, unless you're calling something like to string or something on it, that it would be like, ah, yeah, you know. You may or may not get what you thought you were going to get if it cast it wrong. Um, so, um, yeah, that's that's a good question. But I I don't think you can use var, but now I'm kind of waffling on that. <laughs> All right. Okay, deconstructor. So we have constructors. Um, constructors generally we use to instantiate an instance of a class. We pass in constructor arguments. They get set to um, either properties or fields on that object. We can do a deconstructor, um, which uses the uh, keyword deconstruct. So if I scroll down here, you'll see I have two methods here. Here's my constructor, my 3D point, and here's my deconstructor, keyword deconstruct, has to be that. And you declare it without variables. And then when you're calling this, um, you go up to the top here and you say, you know, var my point equals new point, and then you can deconstruct. This calls the deconstructor by using the tuple syntax, but in this case they're out variables. Yeah. Nothing like confusing and overloading syntax so that uh, you're looking at it going, gosh, what am I looking for here? This is where Visual Studio is your friend because, uh, you know, usually you can use the editor to jump to where it's calling it. But anyway, um, I now take this point and I can deconstruct back into its constituent pieces. Let's be honest, this is just really shorthand for x equals point dot x, y equals point dot y, z equals point dot z. Just say just some typing. Okay, it's not new functionality. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, local functions. Here's another thing that, uh, depending on how you uh, code, I thought I've never had a use for this, but maybe I will think of one. Um, here we've got a method um, called run, and inside the method we have declared a function called print. Okay, so print now is scoped to the run method. It is private to that. Um, reflection will not get it for you. So this is kind of one of those. I guess if you were thinking, oh, I've got the super top secret encryption algorithm that I don't want anyone to be able to reflect into and use, but they can still decompile your code. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I guess it's to protect against people like me. I had a boss one time who insisted that we unit test constructors. So you would, any, method, any parameter you pass into a constructor, you had to have a uh, a property that you could use to pull that back out to make sure it had gotten set correctly. And I'm like, really? We don't trust the compiler enough to say this equals that? He's like, well, what if you had a typo? I'm like, you know, somewhere else in the code, you use that variable, and then you find you have the typo, and you fix it. But anyway, I was always saying, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to bother to new up my connection to the database. I'm going to go find one of your objects and pull its connection off of it, because there's a public property on your object that is the database connection. He's like, no, no, don't do that, don't do that. I'm like, what? It's part of the API. No, you do not do it, but it has to be there for testing. <laughs> Whatever, guy. All right, so. Encapsulation <laughs> Yeah. His statement was that um, unit testing is more important than encapsulation, so live with it. Like, all right, you're the boss for the next 
four months or so until I quit. <laughs> but anyway, um, this is something where you could have it internal to the method and it's, it's hidden, it's inside of your uh, method and you can't get to it. Um, so, I don't know. It still wouldn't solve the problem of you know, having to do unit testing because you couldn't get it to have the unit test check it either. So this is one of those things that someone somewhere has a use case, I have yet to find it. But if you're one of those people and you can think of the use case, they are great. Okay, and then the last one, digit separators. This is just pure syntactic sugar. Um, you can put underscores anywhere in a number now, uh, except at the start, okay? Um, so the, the thing is I can see where, um, like for our hex number here, um, being able to put a separator between the two digits would make it easier to read. Um, I did have a job where I was doing a lot of stuff. We were doing high-speed trading, and everything was coming through TCP sockets as hex. You know, no, no casting this to an object. That takes too much time. You're just reading the raw bytes and you know, as they stream by kind of thing. Um, having something like this so that I could separate out things as I compared it might have been useful in the debugger. Uh, same thing with binary. Other than that, it's just purely, you know, to help you read it better if, if that helps you to read it. Okay. And the last thing here, we have ref, uh, ref returns. Okay, so here I'm doing basically a, a swap. I'm taking an array of integers. I'm getting a ref in val1. So what this is, it's a reference to an integer, and I'm searching into the array for the second position, returning that as a ref. So instead of returning the value, which in this case would be 5, right, because that's position two, um, I would be returning a pointer to five, basically. You know, C-sharp doesn't have pointers, it has references, but, you know, play with me here. Um, and then uh, the next thing I'm doing is getting a ref to position seven, and then I'm calling swap on those. So then I put one in a temp variable, move one, move one, put it back, you know, life is good. My swap is down at the bottom there. Um, but what that lets me do Actually, I take it back. My search is not a position, and it's looking for that value. Or, so the, I'm looking for a 2, which would return a 0, and looking for a 7, which would return a 3. If I'd read my code before I talked, it would help. Uh, but anyway, um, the nice thing is because I have references to these, uh, the array doesn't have to change. So if you think about memory management in .NET, before I had these return refs, if I went to do that first swap, um, so I'd pull out temp and I would move things around. It could possibly, and in most cases, would cause a copy of the array in memory rewriting the elements. And then when I do the next swap, it causes another copy in memory rewriting all the elements. Okay? Which, you know, in our case, they're small, no big deal. If I happen to be dealing with hundreds or thousands of large objects, now, not only do I have the memory I'm copying, I've got all the pointers. When garbage collection runs, it's now got all these things that are laying around or not. You know, generally, if they're objects, it would just, just keep pointers to them. But it's just more overhead. Here, you're just swapping the references. The array's not going to get recopied in memory. OK. And that's it for the, the C Sharp 7 example. So, By the way, the... Uh or whatever using the tuple. Uh -huh. That did work. So. Okay. Nice. All right. So you can use VAR. All right. I, I personally have a problem with VAR, but that's because I do a lot of code reviews where I'm just reading it in a static page. And if it's not obvious, it makes it harder. But uh, anyway, um, <coughs> next thing I want to show you, just kind of some other um, editor things that, that make you have, uh, you know, make it faster for you to program. Here I've just got a application, a UWP app. I'll run it really quick. And we will see uh, this thing come up. Um, so here I've just got a list of, of students and I'm gonna sort it by name. I will sort it by year in school and I will sort it by GPA. And you know, in an incredibly poor thing, uh, you know, poor Bob Cliff, he's always at the top of the list. So. Yeah, but um, you know it's it's not very fancy. It does its little thing, 
the, the thing that it does for me is it has different classes, different things, and I can show off some of the features of the editor. Um, so one of the things you can do is Control-T in here, and this will bring up a new go to all, uh, and I can start typing for things. So in here, maybe I do page, um, and so now it's going to start, and, and I apologize for how hard it is to see, but you can see things where main page, uh, page view model should be in here someplace. Down here, yeah, main page view model. Uh, so I can see different things, you know, it's kind of, if you've used Eclipse, they've had this for forever, it seems like. Um, but Visual Studio's got that. Uh, the other nice thing, um, I can sort by certain things, so I can look and uh, say, I just want to look at files that have page in them. Or I just want to look at types, or classes, or members, or uh, symbols. Um, if you're a keyboard guy, um, there's all, all these have, so like F space is for files, uh, T space is for types, Pound, or M, M space for members, and the pound sign space for symbols. I can also do a go-to line, which I, I use a colon, and then type in a line number. So control T brings up this one dialog, and then I can do uh, you know, this thing that will replace several different um, things that, that we might have had in the past, so for different key, keystrokes or uh, shortcuts, menu I, items, whatever you might have. So. Um, that's something that's kind of nice. Um, I'm just drawing a blank on about half of the demo here, but we'll we'll fix something up. Um, some of the other things that are kind of you know that I appreciate. Uh, if you're in the middle of a long string, uh, you know, and you get to the end, normally you'd have to do uh, like, oh, I need to break the string, so I'm going to do a colon plus, or I'm sorry, quotes plus. And then another quote, and then since it doesn't automatically indent, I have to go back and indent. Now that's just, we're lazy these days. Just get in the middle of a string, hit enter, and it'll do that all for you, except for the indent. But uh, control K, control D. Nope, that doesn't fix it either. All right. I don't know why it's not uh, formatting for me. Oops, get the right key there. Uh, no, not going to do it. When all else fails, add a semicolon. Nah, I, don't, I broke something. All right. Um, it's supposed to do the indent for you as well. It's supposed to make it all nice and neat and fancy. Um, I'm going to guess what I've done is in messing around with some other features, uh, I have turned off. Uh, this in order to get a different demo working. So, uh, but anyway, you know, I, I, I have known people who will spend all day long aligning code. You know, it's like just no. Um, but anyway, that's that will work for you. One thing um, to be aware of uh, is that with the um, if you're using. Uh, Windows and you're doing cross platforms, so you have some places that are line feed, some places that are carriage return line feed. Um, it has been my experience that about half the time when I close this, I'll save it, close it, and then open it again, and it'll tell me I have inconsistent line endings because it's only put a line feed and not a carriage return line feed there. Uh, so I'm sure that's an editor setting someplace. Just Digging down through the bowels of the editor settings, I have not stumbled across that particular setting. So, uh, anyway, that's that's something to be aware of. Um, I can do the the line spacing. Um, let's see, what else am I uh, missing here? Let me actually finish on time if I can't remember what I was supposed to talk about because I had like 20 minutes on this by itself and I'm just drawing a blank. So, um, well, we're going to, oh, that was one that I was supposed to show you. Um, all right. Since I already did this one, in that format, um, good. 
and then we'll do this just because you know we have to have something here and I don't know if this will actually do it or not for me now but I should be able to hit control period um, I have this whole string here below I hit control period no uh, let's var creating And instead of doing that, we'll do, okay. So now if I come over here, um, you know, some of these things where uh, Microsoft for a while has been saying, uh, you know, you have these new features of C-sharp five or six or whatever. Um, the IDE is now starting to give you these hints um, about these. You can do new interpolated strings so I can preview the changes um, and I can make my change um, and it will just go ahead and change it to an interpolated string for me. So um, another thing that it does, and it didn't show it there. Let's see, go to my error list. Do we have, no, just that one error. Okay, so I gotta come back over here and find some code maybe that I can do this on where. Um, well, all right, what, what I'm not gonna be able to do quickly to set up, but uh, one of the things is a lot of times in that um, control period, the, the uh, light bulb or the helper icon icon. Um, one of the things you can do is you can make the change um, either uh, you know to that item to all of the um, make all the changes in a particular file or you can do it into the uh, project or the solution. So um, if you're one of those guys that you know you go back and forth and like oh we always have to use var or somebody else is like no we will never use var. Um, it now makes it very easy for you to find one of those and say make the change across the solution. And then, you know, you can pollute your Git history so that as you're doing this, everyone's like, oh, what changes go back and forth? What the heck is the standard? Somebody act like an adult in this relationship. Um, but, yeah, I don't have a, an example in there that I can show you. But um, for a lot of things, uh, you can do more than just apply it to one place. You can apply it across your particular um, set of code. And... I can't think of what else I was going to say there. So with that, we'll hide that one. We'll go to the next one. All right. Uh, this is a web application, MVC. If I run it, um, please run. Okay. It's going to come up, and uh, this is kind of based off of or similar to Nerd Dinner. Um, this came after it and I forget why they redid Nerd Dinner. It's just, I was looking for Nerd Dinner and this happened to come up. Oh great, I'm gonna run in an incognito browser. Um, so, you know, if you miss Bob, uh, this is open source. You can figure out the little animation and you can get the dog, you know, if you're just... Um, actually, this is a avatar, so yeah, you, sh you should be able to get a paperclip. So, uh, you know, if you're just really, really looking for that. Um, so, uh, I can go through and I can create dinners. Um, I can see the grid, which there's nothing in there. Uh, create a new dinner. It's going to go through. Uh, you know, we got the uh, broccoli tree over there. And, you know, whoops. Actually, stop. Maybe. New nug. I'm sure you guys capitalize it like that as well. You know, our chef. I don't think I have a chef. Yeah. Okay. So I probably have like a database problem here because this should be showing me a lot more than it is. But anyway. Um, yeah, I am connected. Um, my guess is that uh, since I set this demo up, I didn't bother running this last night because I was like, ah, I don't think I'll even have time to get here. 
because uh, I was going to show something else. But since I forgot what I was going to talk about for that other one, it's like, yeah, oh, I can get here. Um, so I didn't, didn't run it, and my guess is that I've upgraded. Um, I'm on the fast ring with Windows. It's done several upgrades since then, and somewhere along the line, I probably um, reset the um, user that SQL Server Express is running under, and I'm betting that there's just no database underneath it. Because um, that has seemed to be a problem that has plagued me uh, across several laptops. I don't know. It doesn't like me. But anyway, that's not the point. Um, our point is that we have this, this uh, application. Um, we have several things here that we can look at as soon as we stop debugging. Um, all right. So... Uh, Oh, I didn't reset after the last one. That would, oh well. That, that really sucks. All right, anyway, we'll at least have one error now, maybe. Um, or probably more, I didn't reset all of them. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to show you here is that in uh, previous versions of Visual Studio, we've had this idea of um, having a, let me go find it over here in Solution Explorer. Um, where, I'm not seeing it now. Okay. Da, 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 da. I guess that's going on. All right, well. Okay, code map. No, not that one, not this one. Yeah. So, yes, my code map. If I pull this up, this has been around for a while and really just gives me a way of visualizing my code. Um, and I think it was an enterprise and professional editions uh, before now, but like when I look at this code, if I come into it, I can see that I have my web UI, and it's got all of these connections, uh, you know, and some of them going here, some of them going there, um, but it's got this one that calls straight out to Entity Framework, and it skips the data layer completely, okay? And that, to me, is kind of a code smell. Uh, so I could use this diagram, and I could go in and look at it, and I could drill down, I can figure out stuff. The other thing I can do is I can go in, if I've got the Enterprise Edition, I can go to um, Architecture, and I can say New Code Map. Okay, um, And the code map is actually going to be a new file, or I'm sorry, a new uh, project. So if I go in here, sorry, not, not Code Map, Dependency Validation. New dependency validation diagram. So code map we had before, dependency validation diagram is going to create for me a new project. Um, it takes a little while to do this, which is why I didn't want to run it, uh, just from scratch. But it'll come up and it will create something that's just a very much blank canvas um, that will be uh, something like dependency validation one layer diagram. Okay. Um, and from there, what I can do is I can go over to my Layer Explorer, and here I've got all of my um, different DLLs. I can pull them on here, and what I do is I will set up from the toolbox a dependency, and I will say that this dependency, you know, I could say that this is allowed to call to that directly, because that's what I've got right now. But what I want to do is say, no, that's not allowed. So now if I build this, and if I haven't screwed things up by adding and subtracting and changing and rearranging, I should get compile errors. No, I, I should get compile errors. Oh, there we go. No, those are not. Okay, you may not be seeing all the dependency validation rules. So I have to go in here and click on my options. Uh, and... Looking for where it's at. Enable full solution analysis. Okay. So now, if I do that, 
and just for the fun of it, we'll save all and then compile. Hopefully, cross your fingers. No, one succeeded up to date. Somebody doesn't like me. Yeah, we don't need that. I'm supposed to be seeing a whole bunch of errors over here because in my worker CS, I have code that is calling directly from this uh, layer into my entity framework. All right, let's go back and look again. All right, let's just do something radical here. Let's just totally nuke that and then go in and say rebuild the solution. Because if I can't get it to error, you know, it's just, isn't that the way it works? Oh, there we go. Hey, errors. Hey. <laughs> All right. Um, now let's see if I can go back to my toolbox, click on a dependency, and I drive, oops, no. Toolbox. Dependency. And I go and I say, from here, you're allowed to call to there. Save this, rebuild the solution. And I should still have some errors because I had the call from, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, I have not turned on the right thing in the right spot for. Um, full solution analysis to find it. What it's supposed to do is supposed to give me errors um, because I have something from web UI calling into Entity Framework DLL, but that's not allowed through this. Um, the nice thing about this is, is that I need Enterprise Edition for this dependency layer validation diagram, but once I have that set up, um, I don't believe that the Community Edition uh, honors it, but all the other paid SKUs will. So you, you buy one Enterprise Edition. I, I didn't say that. You buy Enterprise Edition for all of your really important devs, and you give your con, uh, contractor, consultant, people that you don't care about, just professional. Um, but by having this in the project, it will uh, look at that, and it will uh, enforce that for you. OK? Um, let's see. I thought of one other thing I was supposed to show back there, and this thing keeps popping up and it's, uh, you'd think I would remember on that. So my, I'm going to go back to my students here. Um, there is another thing that's a, a really good feature. Uh, if you've got people who have different style guides or if you're a consultant um, and you're working with different clients, they may have different ideas about style for each of them. And it's really a pain to go in and set up your Visual Studio and all the options You'll go into your tools, go into options, and um, you know, and I, I never have know where to find this. I think it's like under text editor, C sharp, um, code style, and then you start going through here and saying, okay, uh, this, you know, for this particular thing, we click here, and you know, that's general, but then we go to formatting, and, uh, you know, maybe we, yeah, see, I, wait a second. I had the automatic formatting on semicolon. I don't know why it did that. I was thinking I'd uncheck that. New lines, you know, where do you put new lines? You can uh, play around with this. I actually had somebody that I worked for who's like, I really love the way JavaScript looks, so we're going to do the opening brace on the end of the line for C Sharp as well. <coughs> then when I just look at the code, how do I tell if it's C-sharp or JavaScript, especially if I'm using var everywhere? Come on, <laughs> give a guy a break. Uh, but anyway, you, you, know, you could go through and set all this up. The problem is, is that you forget it, and then you check in your code, and it's a different style. So uh, Microsoft has decided to work with the editor config consortium. So I can go in here, and I can add a new file. Uh, add a new item, and this new item, um, I will just make a text file. Um, and the only reason I'm going to do text file 
is because then it doesn't try to add in additional code there. Uh, am I just blind or did text files disappear? Oh, right there at the top. Hey. All right. One thing you have to do, you have to call it dot editor config. Okay, and I'll add it. And then in there, there's some syntax on this. So if I go grab all this code here. Those are the demo notes that I had for other people doing this. Um, so you can see several things. One, if you're going to look at this, you need to go out to editorconfig.org. Um, you know, out there and you can see the syntax, you can see everything else. Um, but I can set up different things. End of line is going to be carriage return line feed. Okay, so now if you're on a Mac, you still do carriage return line feed. They'll probably, like, in the world. And, you know, if you're old like me, you're always annoyed by this because when you used a typewriter, it was always line feed, then carriage return. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, um, but I can set that up. I can say, instead of using spaces, use tabs. And indent two tabs instead of four spaces or, you know, whatever it might be. So I can set this up. I can um, do all of this nice fancy stuff. Um, I'm going to save my editor config. I'm going to go back in here, and I think it's under view. Uh, or maybe it was under edit. I'm trying to remember where I went to edit advanced. Uh, I'm looking for something that's like show white space. View white space right there. Okay, so here, uh, again, very hard to see on the projector, but you can see the dots are spaces, right? So I've, I've got this code, I've, I've got things working. Um, so I'm going to save, um, and then I'm just going to kind of go, the, in order for the editor config to actually start taking effect, uh, let me go through and actually do some things that will make it so that we know that things are broken. Okay, so um, this says avoid this in me. Um, I'm going to change this to be uh, da, 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 true colon error. Okay, so I'm going to say if you're not using this or me, depending on your language of choice, then flag that as an error. Okay, and Okay, so I'm going to save that. Um, and then I need to reload files in order for it to work. Um, the easiest way to do that, just go nuclear on it, close the solution, and then go down here to recent projects and solutions, open it up again, and nothing's different, right? But if I go over here to my page view model now, yes, I have all these errors, okay? So, um, I did consulting in a place once where they were like, we're a Java shop, we have no idea what's going on, but um, we, we see this style cop thing. Yeah, well, we have no idea what's going on with .NET, um, I should say. We see this style cop thing, and you're only here on a one-year contract, so when you leave, we want to make sure that the next guy who comes in can pick this up. So you're going to, you know, we want you to follow the style cop rules. Which, by the way, if you just style cop out of the box, looks like nothing like any C-sharp you've ever done. <laughs> this everywhere, your um, usings are inside the name space. You have to have documentation for every single thing. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I digress. But that was the rules. And so what I was doing was I was doing I, I code, and then I would compile and as a post build step, I would run style cop on it and I'd get all sorts of errors. And then I'd go back and do this again. With the dot editor config, I could go in and set up all those rules inside of my editor config. And then as I type, I would get the IntelliSense to say, oh, you got to do this dot, this dot everywhere. Um, here's a good uh, that I was talking about um, where I have multiple changes. I can now say fix this in this document, the project, or the solution. Okay? So, this is where you say, do I believe? Do I trust the coding gods at Microsoft not to screw up all of my code if I say project or solution? 
And, yeah, that's a personal decision. I'm not here to tell you one way or the other. Uh, some things I would be, like adding this to everything, I'd probably do, because if it screws it up, it's easy to revert. Um, but uh, other things I might be like, mm, yeah, let me just do one at a time. The other thing here is I've only got 12 errors. It's not that hard to go and find them and do them one at a time if I had to. Okay, so those are there. Um, let me see what else we've got going on. I think that's kind of the main thing to show there. Um, I do want to go in here and do file new project. And I'm going to go to web and I want to do an ASP.NET Core web application.NET Core. So one of the things if you were doing any kind of um, the betas and, and stuff like that, um, when I created this before, it was actually compiling, uh, it would set up the project to compile to both .NET Core and to the .NET Framework. You can still do that, but out of the box, now they're asking you to choose which one you're going to do. Uh, so in this case, .NET Core, um, I can choose whatever version of the .NET Framework I want to up here because it's just going to totally ignore it. Well, totally ignore it is probably bad because it's got to be at least, I think, 6.1 6 or 6.2. Uh, 4.61, 4.62. I don't think I can go back to 4.52. Um, oh, well, I can. Anyway, um, I haven't upgraded this to put the uh, .NET Framework uh, 4.7 on it. Uh, I've been working a lot of hours and have not found a convenient time where I said, you know, if I totally screw this up, I've got plenty of time to recover from it. So, uh, so I haven't done that upgrade on this one yet. Um, but let's go ahead and click OK. Um, and while we're here and it's coming up, um, now it's going to ask me, you know, do I want a web application, web API? This is largely academic at this point because um, one of the new things with .NET Framework Core is a common controller. So I no longer have to inherit from either controller or web controller. I just inherit from controller. Um, you know, just choosing one or the other gives me different defaults. Um, I can change my authentication like before and I can enable Docker support. I'm not going to click that now because I want to show you what it would look like afterwards. Okay? And I will pray that it works. Um, I've had problems with Docker and I'll explain what when I get there. But <clears throat> while this is building, one of the things to be aware of is with Visual Studio 2017, they have changed um, in the betas and .NET, uh, the .NET Core before, they were using a project.json file. They've now moved that back into the CS Proj. Um, and the reason behind that was they sat there and said, look at all the build tools out there that understand CS Proj and that we would have to rewrite and change in order to get it to understand project.json. And by the way, all that crap, all that stuff in the, your uh, project file didn't have to be there. Visual Studio added it. All the goods, all the other stuff um, didn't really need to be there. And so um, we can just ignore it. And for the most part, um, our CS Proj, our web build, all of the tooling that we have will just work. OK. Um, so here's another cool thing that Visual Studio 2017 and .NET Core will let, let you do. I have the project is open. And I didn't have to unload it. OK. And the other thing is, if I go out here to my dependencies, um, I should see. Well, maybe I don't have to do a NuGet restore. Uh, but yeah, doesn't think I need a restore. Um, I can go out here and by default, files are kind of included in here. Um, so if I want to, uh, you'll notice I don't have all the goods. I don't have the files, build dependencies, all the other things. If you ever went in there and looked at it, you're just like, if I type one thing wrong, I'm dead. <laughs> Make three copies in six different places before I ever think about changing this. Now, I can, I can play. So let's say I want to exclude viewstart.xml from the project. So by default, um, it's going to look and it's going to say, hey, if there's anything in here and it's got a .cs, a .cshtml, a 
CSS.html. Blah, blah blah. You know, it's got a whole bunch of different things that different um, extensions have different handlers for when you build and everything else. Um, if I want to exclude something, I click on that and reload. Voila. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. What in the world just happened there? I wasn't even touching the keyboard. It broke. Well, I, I like the, the CSS project files or something yeah. like that because they used to be a merge nightmare. Yeah. So, um, now where did I go? Did I package target fallback? Okay, there we are. Our item group content remove. So that removed it from the, the project. If I decide I want it back, I can do that as well. Um, and you know all the things that we loved about CS Proj. Yeah, so it's back in the in there. Maybe come on. Oh, I have to actually save. That's kind of important. And there we go. It's back in there. Um, you know, if I wanted to do a package reference include uh, and then Microsoft uh, dot um, I don't know ASP.NET Core dot oh come on I'm not getting IntelliSense I should be getting IntelliSense here um, on this but but I, if I knew what I was typing I should be able to just type it in here um, get exactly what I want and life would be good I'm going to not mess around with this too much. Um, um, yeah, your packages.config is pretty much gone as well. There's, um, I'm trying to remember, I saw somewhere in the late beta a statement that it would still be supported but be going away sometime. Uh, but by default they don't add it and I wouldn't personally. Um, uh, upgrade. This is the one place you need to be careful about upgrade. Everywhere else, um, all the new features of the .NET um, are pretty much backwards compatible to Visual Studio 2015. But because of the change um, in the project files for .NET Core only, okay, this is only a .NET Core thing. If I go and create a Windows um, application, I open it, I go and try to edit the project file, it'll go, uh uh, you have to unload the project first. Okay, but only for .NET Core. Um, when I upgrade it, Visual Studio 2015 doesn't understand the syntax. So this is a one-way upgrade. If you're doing .NET Core, um, either you know, ASP.NET Core or just .NET Core console apps or whatever, um, it is a one-way upgrade. So that's the place you really, really need to be careful of. Um, other than that, just about everywhere else, um, I can create things, I can still use them in Visual Studio 2015, and uh, I I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, the, the only other things like that layer diagram and the, the validation enforcement, Visual Studio, 20, Visual Studio 2015 doesn't understand that. So uh, there are some new features, but uh, for the most part, uh, Visual Studio 2015 will allow me to target .NET Framework 4.5, uh, or yeah, 4, I'm sorry, 4.6.1, 4.6.2, I can use the C Sharp 7 syntax because when it compiles uh, with the, the new compiler, it compiles it down into something that, that will work. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is the one place I can think of where I do danger, danger, Will Robinson, don't, uh, go, don't go and upgrade this and then check it into source control and go, yeah, I had a good day today. Because you'll have a bad day tomorrow <laughs> uh, trying to roll that guy back. Okay, so um, I've got my application here. Um, if you've done anything at all with it, uh, .NET Core, I can go and I can run and compile this. Um, build succeeded. It's going to open up the browser. I'm going to get my page. Do, 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 do. We wait around. Somebody know any good jokes? Um, things like that. Really? Come on. Okay. So here's my page. I can go out and learn more. It's, it, you know, it's not all that fancy. Um, but, uh, and I probably shouldn't have done that, but let's go ahead and stop this. If I stop, um, you know, I've got, I've got the whole um, 
I'm drawing a blank on what they call it, the browser or something, browser link, where I can change my code, I can save, I just go over to the browser and it will refresh it. Um, or sometimes I have to hit F5 to refresh it. Depends, um, you know, the changes I'm making. But basically, anytime I save, it's doing a background compile. Um, I can see those changes in, in my uh, ASP.NET core. Um, other things here, under dependencies, you'll see Bower. So um, Bower, Gulp, Grunt, um, all those task runners, uh, NPM as a task runner, um, certainly supported and has first class support. Um, if you add it in, I forgot something that's very, very important. I will jump to it in just a second, though. Um, I think I've had enough time. So uh, the, the, um, the task runner's very much supported, very much something that you can work with. Uh, but I want to show you, because you know, everybody's talking about microservices and Docker and everything else like that. So um, I can go in here and I can say, where is it? It's missing. Yeah, the solution. You don't oh, yeah, I need to. No, I thought it was on. Yeah. Got to be on the project. Uh, add Docker support. Usually it's like right up in here. Okay, Docker, Docker, Docker. Here, Docker, 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 Docker. <laughs> All right. Maybe I should have checked that add Docker support at the beginning. Um, yeah. Um, it is, for our intents and purposes, I'm going to jump back to one that was actually working, which, you know, I named these so well, I'm going to go from Web Application 6 to Web Application 5, uh, because, hey, you just revert by going back one number, right? Um, now, so what will happen is, in a future day, I will be looking at my code and going, do I need that or not? Where did I do that? Let's look at the dates on the files. Where would I have been about that time? Um, but anyway, this one here, when you add the Docker support as a new project, because this is just still working off the file system, there's, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily the same .cs proj, but I add in some files here, uh, my Docker Compose build YAML and my Docker Compose YAML. So um, if you use Docker and Docker Compose, Docker Compose lets me do a Docker Compose up, and it will build up a whole environment. Um, so before I left. InsightSales.com, we were doing everything in Docker, uh, running it in AWS, but the nice thing was we would set up our Compose file um, and a new developer would come on or another team would say, I need to call you microservices. We'd say, go, go clone this repo and type Docker Compose up. And it would set up the networking, it would set up, uh, well, it set up all the different machines, the networking, the DNS, the everything to get them running. And then we'd say, okay, just call localhost, port, blah, 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 and it would work. Unless you're on Windows and you had to go through the extra step to port forward from Windows to the Linux virtual machine to Docker. But, you know, that was something that I think I was about the only one that was on Windows. So, um, we get these two different Docker Compose files. They do basically the same thing, but the difference is going to be that our Docker Compose CI build YAML is going to be for our CI environment. So in here, um, we'll do our .NET restore, we'll do all, a whole bunch of other stuff that if we're on our local machine, we'll assume that Visual Studio or we would see in the command line that we're missing things we just type in and do uh, for ourselves. So um, the other thing that it adds down here is a Docker file. So I open that up and the thing that I like is I did Docker files so infrequently, um, generally what I would do is go find one on my hard drive, copy it, and make a few changes. But I can do IntelliSense here. So I can do like maintainer, you know, and then it's going to tell me name and an example. So Scott, go lightly, you know, Scott, and, uh, because some of us can type and talk and others of us can't. But anyway, I can, I, you know, I get the IntelliSense and I can do all this fun stuff. So it allows me to go and do that. Now, if the demo gods are with me and they haven't been so far tonight, um, I should be able to control shift B and build this and it will run. 
it did not run for me for, I don't know, a week. And I was beating my head against the wall, couldn't figure it out. And then I ran across a blog post that explained if you're using Azure Active Directory or some other external directory to authenticate to your machine, which I happen to be doing, um, you do not have the correct tokens in order to launch the Docker service. So you have to go and create a new user as an administrator, assign, uh, log on as a service, and a whole bunch of other permissions to that user, and then it'll run. So um, if you get a message and it says something like, um, you know, failure in the something build stage, and you're just like, what in the world? You know, um, it's probably because Docker is not running. So here, uh, Docker is running apparently for me, um, and I was too quick to close things down. Um, but before, does anyone happen to remember what the port number was on the uh, the the uh, browser? I don't either. And I'm looking for it. I think it's in appsettings.json. No, it's not. No, unless it's down here. All right, I'm going to spend forever looking for it, and we won't find it. But um, if you start, it may have actually been in my project file. OK, if I don't find it really quick, we'll just go on. Yeah, I don't see it there either. Somewhere in here, in one of these config files that I can't remember where now, um, it had two ports, one if I was just running it and one if I was running it in Docker. And I was going to show you which one, because now you'll notice that because I have Docker support, I can either run it in Docker um, or not. I and mean, that's, that's kind of my choice because Docker composes my startup here. So I'll run it in Docker. We'll run this. Do, 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 do. It'll come up. Is this going to run in Docker for Windows? Or yes. Containers or? Docker for Windows. So it's, it's actually compiling this and pushing it out to a Linux VM on my machine that is at, to a Linux VM, to a container on that Linux VM. So it's running a real Docker container on Linux. And boom, now I, I had a breakpoint there. I'm actually debugging into from Windows into Linux into Docker. That's awesome. Yeah. So I go ahead and I run, continue here. Um, I should get a browser window up there any minute now. Browser window, browser window. No, there we go. Okay, 32768. That seems to me like that was the same one as before, which makes me think that something changed um, somewhere along the line. It used to be separate port numbers, but let's, let's humor me, 32768. Let's see if I go back out here, stop debugging. Uh, go change web application 5 to be my startup project. And then IS Express. And I bring this up. And yeah. Come on. 1798. Why are we bringing up all of these? Apparently. IE crash someplace because it's like oh I have to restore all of your windows yeah so I've got a totally different port number here 1798 so running in docker and running out of docker um, sorry I couldn't find the uh, config file for you but uh, that lets you do those things now the one last thing that I I think is going to be really important I have here code two things um, that I want to show you. Uh, this code, I added this line that's failing on purpose. Okay, um, And the reason that I did that, I want to go into the test where it's failing. And I want to say debug. Okay, I'm getting a null exception, by the way, on purpose. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and debug this because they have done something that is just oh, amazing. Okay. So when this runs and I eventually get to where I fail, and I will fail because I'm very good at that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the code will fail. 
I am not my code. I am not my code. I am not my code. All right. Okay. I don't know if full screen mode will show this for me or not. Yes, it will. Except that it's all messed up. So, again, object reference not set to an instance of object, but look at what it's telling me. No. You were doing so much better before. All right. System.net.http request message content.get return null. Okay, how many times have you seen a instance of an object or object reference set to an instance uh, not set to an instance of an object you have no idea on that line what was null and so you go in there and you're like going okay request message bring that one up oh no that's got something uh, content oh, okay there we are okay now the error message for the most part it's not 100% foolproof but for the most part it will tell you what it was trying to do when it got that null reference exception so very very nice we love that all right, so function f5, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you finished. Life is good. Uh, where is that line of code that's dying? Let me just get rid of it because really it was there just to show that error message, and that was it. The other thing is, watch along the gutter on the left. Check boxes. And yes, so live unit testing, all right? Uh, works with, um, uh, in this case, I'm using in unit, x unit, ms test, um, a whole bunch of other testing. Um, and what I do is I go up to my test and I say live unit testing, and I can start, stop, and pause it, and restart it, and everything else. And it will show me checkboxes for code that's passing, um, dashes for code that's not being tested, and the x's for code that is failing. Um, so, very nice that way. If you've used InCrunch for this or ReSharper, they, well, InCrunch basically does this. I'm thinking uh, no need to renew an InCrunch license at this point, but that's me. Um, it, it does a lot of the same things. Um, I type a few seconds after I finish typing, it will be compiling the affected tests in the background and start running them. Um, I will admit InCrunch seemed just a little bit faster, but hey, you know what? Um, what they charge, I charge by the hour. I can be slow. <laughs> did I did record that, did you? All right. <laughs> so, um, no, that's, uh, it's, I mean, I, it's probably seconds at the most, and uh, I tend to waste more time, you know, figuring out what I'm going to go get for lunch or something like that. So, um, not a huge difference between those. Okay. Um, with that, I think I'm probably just about out of time. I've got time for maybe just a couple of questions if you have any. Yeah. Uh, do all the products use show the coverage? Um, so, you know, I have only used the Enterprise Edition because I get it for free with the MSDN, and so that's what I go and grab. Um, I believe professional enterprises are the only two. The community does not do the live unit testing. Um, and any live unit testing. Oh, the other thing is, um, when you first install it, you'll start live unit testing and it'll fail and say something like you need an instance of a test runner. Um, so in the, in the project that you're testing, your main project, um, if we go up to that and look at our NuGet packages, because this was the other thing that, um, you know, the first time I did it, I was like, I got in unit, I've got this, I've got that, it's telling me, I need up here in the installed, I have an update as well. Um, and inject, where we are. In, uh, in unit three test adapter, because I'm using in unit. But you need a test adapter in what you're going to be testing against to do the live unit testing. Uh, but um, I believe it's just professional enterprise that has the live unit testing in it. It may be an enterprise only uh, thing. In which case, you know, the difference between professional and enterprise, if all you're looking for is live unit testing, you can certainly buy in crunch or resharper and be money ahead. Because resharper will do live unit testing as well. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So back to your C sharp 7 stuff. I'm yeah. kind of ticking off the new features as you go through them, but 
one you missed was generalized async return types. Do you know anything about that? Um, no. Because I don't, don't understand the, the doc. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> generalized async return types. Well, so, it says that you don't have to return task test to you or, or avoid you can return other things. Oh, okay. But I don't understand what the, the rule is for these other things. Yeah. I I haven't, I guess I just got used to returning task or task T or, you know, uh, something like that. So I haven't looked into that. All right. Um, yeah, sorry. Hey. Yes. Um, in your student's project, I noticed uh -huh. you had... Uh, GPA equals 3.5 M? Yes. Is that a new thing? Or no. Or am I behind? No, that is... Um, where is my students? Oh, of all of them to close, that was the one that I, I got rid of when I did a file new over here. Um, the M, I'm trying to remember what type of course is it to. So that's... A double or a float or yeah, a decimal. decimal or something, yeah. Okay, thanks. I, I forget which data type, but I just wanted that particular data type for something else I thought I was going to do, and I never got around to, um, to doing it. I was going to do an average of the class, <clears throat> and I wanted the smaller, so it probably would be decimal. Um, just because the way that computers track floating point numbers is not accurate. And you can end up with these really weird rounding errors. So by keeping the numbers as small as possible, you don't end up with something like you know one point two zero 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 eight or something. You know, it tends to be a little bit smarter about cutting it down and stuff like that. So I just wanted to make sure that I was coercing it to the right one. Okay. All right.